Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Weekly News with, uh, of course, Nick Bendel, and we're on the For the Property Investor podcast. Welcome, Nick. How are you doing? I'm doing Fine. very, very well, Owen. Thank you for having me. And uh, what's been happening in your last uh, week since we last spoken? Well, the big highlight of my week was going to the MFAA Mortgage Broking Conference in Melbourne last week, flying from Sydney to Melbourne. I am the owner of Hunter and Scribe, which is a an agency that writes content for property and finance professionals. And we work with dozens of mortgage brokers throughout Australia. So I always go to the mortgage broking conferences, partly to meet people and partly because I, I find the sessions interesting and educational. So I, I flew to Melbourne, had a really good time at the conference and met some really uh, good people and had some good conversations as well. Yeah, uh, I didn't know you were going there. It's um, it's a uh, fun time at the MFAA conference. It's been a while since I've gone, since I was um, no longer a a uh, mortgage broker. Well, the the next one is National Finance Brokers Day in Sydney in August, and then the FBAA usually hold their conference around November, generally on the Gold Coast. Wow. Well, I'll, I'll be up in. Um... Gold Coast in early September for a uh, buyer's agents conference. So um, it's good to see now that buyer's agents as a industry uh, are starting to come together and um, and meet as groups because it's uh, to see the the mighty rise of the the mm. buyer's agent in especially the last uh, half a dozen or so years. Um, it has been um, meteoric, and it's um, yeah, it's great to see. Yeah, I, I I really like it too. It's funny. I bought my first investment property in 2015, and I used a buyer's agent. And back then, very few people were using buyer's agents. And when I told yeah. friends I was using a buyer's agent, most of them had no idea what a buyer's agent was. Now everyone knows. So there has been a big change in the industry. Yes. So um, no, it's good. Yeah, it's a bit like mortgage broking in the mm. in the nineties. Um, so, uh, and now, as we've spoken many times, mortgage brokers are uh, responsible for what is it, seventy something percent of all mortgages written. More than seventy percent, which is exciting. And I have no idea why anyone would go direct to lender. No, well, um, there there can be some um, uh, some reasons too. Um, but it's a very small percentage. Um, um, but um, yeah. Anyway, what's in the news this week, Nick? Well, the first story is mortgage broking industry embraces change. The theme of last week's MFAA mortgage broking conference was Hello Future. Keynote speakers included scientific futurist Catherine Ball, behavioural scientist Milo Wilkinson, and communications expert Ruth Callahan. The presenters explained that the future is going to look very different from the present and advise brokers on what they should be doing to prepare for this future. That begs the question, how will the property and finance industries change over the next decade? Owen, mm. keen to hear your thoughts. How do you think that property buying will change over the next 10 years? Well, it's uh, it's going to be interesting the next 10 years. It's going to be a, a mixture of going back to um, um, old-fashioned ways. And uh, we were just talking about buyer's agents. And I think buyer's agents are going to affect a lot of change in the industry, mm -hmm. as they already have. Um, a lot more technology is going to be involved. But... Uh, I think that technology is going to be um, um, affected between uh, different professionals. So your buyer's agent and your sales agent, and then you've got your mortgage brokers. So they'll be all, all doing that research and then providing that uh, advice directly to the consumer. So from a consumer's point of view, I think they'll be doing less and less um, research themselves and employing more professionals. Mm. Because as we get more um, 
AI tools coming into uh, into effect. We'll see that you know what you see online, you can't necessarily be able to trust as well as you you could earlier mm. in past You're, years. The uh, the rise of of more uh, advanced technology makes perfect sense. That's how the world works. I, I was mm. very interested to hear what uh, what you said about buyers agents in America. Of course, most or generally sellers are represented by an agent and buyers are represented by an agent. Yes, in Australia, always have been. Generally, sellers are represented by an agent, but only a small minority of buyers are represented by an agent. I'm wondering, in ten years' time, do you think a majority of buyers will be represented by an agent? Yes, I think so. It's but it, it'll grow. It might not happen as quickly as as we think, um, because change doesn't happen as quickly as 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 we think, um, even if it's available to us. So it'll um, be a bit like the the mortgage broking industry. There, um, everyone became aware of what a mortgage broker was in the '90s and early 2000s, and but then it really didn't uh, they didn't get the majority of written business until within the last what ten years at most. So um, actually, it was probably sooner than that. Um, it was probably um, about six years ago um, that they cracked the fifty percent mark. So someone correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I'm going off memory there. So. It's um, so it's something that will will definitely creep up on us, and more and more people will rely on a, a professional to help them weed through all of the information that's out there because we're now overloaded with information. And uh, talking to clients these days uh, who are trying to make a decision, yeah, it's information overload, and they can spend. You know, months, if not years, uh, trying to make a decision about what type of property to buy because they get um, different information from different people. They try to do the research themselves. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, a lot of this information is free on things like podcasts. Mm. Jeez. Um, <laughs> um, so it, it's about weeding through that information to be able to uh, work out um, what is uh, relevant to them and what they're comfortable with. And your business, Lee Field, is a national property management business. You're in five states. Yes. So you, you've always got the, your finger on the pulse in terms of renting. So I'm wondering, 10 years from now, how do you think the rental market might look? I, and I'm talking more in terms of the experience for investors and for tenants. Yes, well, there, there's um, definitely going to be a lot more change. There's going to be less of the traditional local agent who is the property manager. Um, and I'm not just saying that because that's what I do, but that there is a greater trend. There's more and more businesses and and it just makes more sense uh, you know, to be able to run a, a good, successful, standalone property management business it requires a lot more volume. Doesn't mean that there are not people on the ground. There's definitely people on the ground who open the property, show the property, do inspections, and do all of those things that have to be done at the property. Um, but it means that uh, clients can get, uh, who are the, the property owners, uh, they can get a better experience, better service, um, and for for all of their properties that they might own. And um, and then it's um, uh, the each of those businesses that are the, that are running that type of model can provide a standardised level of service across the board um, that isn't reliant on the one single property manager to do everything themselves, and um, that that's been a, a, a an issue in the past where uh, you've got a single property manager. Uh, controlling everything in in mm. the one local office, and um, see so you, you haven't got this standardisation of 
of levels of service. And uh, that, that's probably the biggest feedback, uh, negative feedback that uh, we, we've always got from, from um, the industry and um, stakeholders, uh, yeah, mainly tenants as well as owners as well, is this level of service. And um, a lot of the time, uh, they're not aware of the of what should be happening. So there's a level of education for the clients as well. And but it's also um, then delivering on that um, on those expectations. So um, it's setting expectations through um, education and uh, and then delivering on them. Uh, so so that that's probably going to be the biggest change. There'll be a lot more outsourcing of services, a lot more technology to be able to uh, allow that to, to happen. Um, but uh, I think the, the days of the, uh, the local sales office in, in your suburb that also does property management, I think that um, will be the biggest change where that won't longer, will no longer exist. Mm, I, I'm wondering... Also, if we look ahead 10 years to 2034, how things will be in terms of legislation, because there can sometimes be tension between landlords' rights and tenants' rights. Where do you think mm. the pendulum will be leaning in 10 years' time? Um, oh, I think there's going to be a lot more people that are renting, uh, for sure, uh, especially with the rise of the, the rent vesta. So a lot more people renting and then owning investment properties themselves, which I think is is a is a great thing. So yes, there, there'll be um, more legislation in favour of tenants' rights. In fact, we just had another change announced yesterday in New South Wales um, by the Premier, where no grounds it evictions for tenants on a periodic lease. Um, will no longer be allowed. So it's it it sounds harsh for the property owner on on the surface, but we've we've seen it and experienced it in other states, and it's not that big a problem. We just need to um, probably it, it gives us a reason to make sure that we follow our own procedures of preferring tenants to be on a fixed term lease. And so um, I, I think what the the state government has done has is really just a um, uh, they tweaked the law um, to um, make themselves look good in the eye, in the eyes of the electric um, because it's um, really it, it's uh, it it's, uh, hasn't really made any fundamental changes. But all of these little tweaks, they're, all, they're, all they're doing is um, uh, closing off some gates uh, for loopholes um, that are little ones, um, what would be you know, seen as loopholes for um, some property owners to uh, be able to uh, get away with um, getting rid of tenants, um, I think. But... Apart from apart from that, yes, there'll be um, uh, more changes in the next ten years. I I I would expect um, um, not in the the um, property owners' favour, but there could uh, we we could be seeing a lot more built to rent schemes as well. Mm. So uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of change over the next ten years. Well, we'll. Go back and listen to this episode again in 10 years' time and, and see how many predictions you got right. In the meantime, <laughs> let's move on to our second okay. story. Housing supply lagging demand. Australia will struggle to meet the federal government's target to build 60,000 homes per quarter over the next five years, judging by the latest data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Work started on only 39,715 dwellings in the March quarter, not 60,000. And that 39,715 figure, it was 0.5% higher than the quarter before, but it was 13.5% lower than the year before. The government's target is 1.2 million homes over five years, which translates to 240,000 per year or 60,000 per quarter. Oh, and if we have a look at that target of 1.2 million homes over five years, 
do you think we'll be able to achieve that target? Short answer is no. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> it looks like it'll be a. Uh, uh, I mean, they were they were behind from the eight ball. Um, yeah, unless they unless they're going to really start uh, ramping up uh, the uh, uh, the land releases as as well as approvals for you know multifamily dwellings so unit blocks and um, townhouse developments uh, to be able to get them done quickly in the in those last uh, two years then um, uh, yeah it, but that that is likely meaning that uh, in those last two years they'll have to be producing a hundred thousand properties per quarter Mm. Well, you've actually kind of, uh, sorry to interrupt, you've kind of hit the nail on the head here because in the media it's reported that the government is going to, it's trying to build 1.2 million homes, but it's not the government that's going to build them. The government is building just a tiny percentage. It's the private sector that's meant to build the yeah. vast majority of these 1.2 million homes. So the government, the federal government needs to create conditions that allow for the private sector to do that. So they need to facilitate the building of 1.2 million homes rather than building them themselves. And the things you mentioned a minute ago are things that would need to happen for the private sector to step in. Yeah. Is there anything else that would need to happen that would incentivize the private sector to increase the rate at which they're building it and also give them the ability to increase the rate? Uh, well, the biggest thing the government could do to uh, make it easier for the private sector to be able to build more homes and houses is uh, you know, tax incentives. Uh, it's Now, it's not tax incentives for the investor because everyone's going to come at me at, uh, on the socials and saying, you know, um, thinking that uh, in investors don't need more tax incentives, but it's not about giving the end investor tax incentives is about giving the uh, making it easier for developers and builders to be able to get started building. And when you've got red tape and uh, the government wants all their money up front and it's at every level of government, state, federal, uh, as uh, well as local government, they all want their money first before they can start turning soil. So that's the biggest holdup. So if they can defer those payments uh, until uh, until the property is finished, if they can, you know, or if they can give discounts on those to be able to uh, get this moving. Otherwise, we're just going to see property prices continue to go up, and rental prices continue to go up uh, because of a lack of supply of property. It all comes back to supply and demand. Yes, it does. Well, let's move on to our final story, Owen. Renovations borrowing hits record $768 million. Mm. If it feels like there are a lot of home renovation jobs happening in your neighbourhood right now, you're not imagining things. Owner-occupiers borrowed $768 million for the purpose of alterations, additions and repairs in May, which was the fourth consecutive monthly record, according to the latest data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. The amount of renovations borrowing in May was also 68.8% higher than the year before. Owen, do you think the reason we're experiencing so much renovating activity right now is because homeowners are deciding it's too expensive to move and it would be better to renovate instead? Oh, that's uh, definitely part of the part of the reason. It's um, the changeover costs. Are just huge. Going back to what I was just talking about in the in the previous story about uh, the government taxes. Mm. If you've got um, um, if you've got a um, homeowner who's transitioning transitioning to retirement, and they're looking at downsizing, they do the sums. They they want to stay in the same area. Uh, to be able to be close to kids or grandkids. And uh, they start doing the sums and, and they go, oh, it's, you know what? Um, when we do retire in a couple of years, because we're this is what we're planning for right now, it's you know, bang for buck for what we can get for our money. By the time we pay agents fees uh, for selling, by the time we 
pay stamp duty. Stamp duty is the big killer. It's, uh, uh, yeah, there's there's $100,000 that's just gone, if not $150,000. Um, so it, it just doesn't make financial sense for a lot of people to, to, to move. So there are... They look at it and go, well, if we um, take fifty thousand that we have in equity, um, and renovate the property that we're in now to uh, to to be uh, to to do what we need to for the future, then um, why don't we do that instead? Mm. So, you know, fifty thousand might be a bit low in the, these these days, but just an example of of. Um, of um, how people are thinking when they're looking at possibly downsizing. Now, that causes some more issues within the supply and demand um, scenario that we keep talking about, where we've got older people in, in and retirees in, in properties and houses that are way too big for them. They don't have the income to be able to maintain those properties. So those pro properties end up falling into disrepair. And meanwhile, we've got young families who with double incomes on good incomes that can't afford to buy a house big enough because they don't have the, uh, the, the deposit or as well as the... Uh, uh, the money for stamp duty to be able to get into these bigger places. So it's it's a so the the one big problem is in both of those scenarios is stamp duty. Mm -hmm. So that's where we really need to come back to stamp duty reform, which the former New South Wales government was was making some inroads into. And of course the current government, as soon as they came in, they scrapped it. No foresight at all about um, the, the future of the industry and how to help um, the uh, fluidity and the liquidity in the housing market to be able to help the changing needs of our society and community. I'm wondering, uh, Owen, uh, the sort of conversations you have around renovations with your landlord clients. I'm guessing some of them come to you with questions around doing renovations maybe to add value to the property or increase yep. the rental appeal. So I'm wondering what sort of questions do they ask and what sort of advice do you give? Um, yeah, the, the the questions come at, you know, is it worthwhile you know, renovating the kitchen or the bathrooms? Or should we just give it a coat of paint and new carpet? You know, how much should we spend and and will it make a difference in the rental return? And uh, the answers to those questions really come down to the individual property and the condition of it and, and what has to be done versus what could be done. Mm. And But a lot of the time, the, the rental return, like the expected rent that you should get back from a property, won't necessarily change uh, or... Yeah, depending on on um, on whether it's being renovated or not, but what it will do is is make it easier to find a good tenant, and it'll be quicker to get a a good tenant, and you're more likely to get a a better tenant rather than a tenant who might not be so good. So they can be the the biggest differences. Uh, now, of course, depending on on whether it's worthwhile to spend a lot of money on the property, yes, you can make huge changes to to the rental return as well as the value. Um, so, if you if you're making wholesale changes to a property that cha that drastically changes its value, then yes, that will make a big difference to the rental return. Um, but most investors uh, are mum and dads who are just trying to get ahead with um, financially and by investing in investment property, which provides rental stock for renters, um, which actually helps 
uh, rents come down eventually if there is enough. So we need more investors to buy more more investment properties. And so when they look at investing, um, they're not necessarily looking to um, spend a lot of money on renovations. Uh, if all if they're wanting to be a passive investor as as much as possible. Mm, well, I'm actually looking to build a couple of granny flats now with with uh, a mm. couple of my properties. So I, I'm hoping to increase my yield and uh, yes. also do my bid for the nation's housing supply. Well done, Nick. We need it. Um, but yeah, granny flats as um, as an addition to an existing property is probably the easiest and best thing that uh, an investor could do. If there are, if if it's uh, suitable for their property, to be able to uh, add rental return and add add um, add more value to their to their investment. Well, on that note, thank you as always for the great chat. Really interested with the insights you shared, and looking forward to seeing you again next week. No problem, Nick. And of course, thank you for um, coming on board and bringing the news for us to talk about. See you next week.